Mogelijk? Ja. ja. Oh, kijk aan. Dan zal ik me stil houden. All right. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this special broadcast uh, live from uh, the lab in Delft uh, at uh, at in Holland. Um, and today we have a very special guest. Um, uh, since a year we've been working very actively together with Mr. Piet Lammertje. And Mr. Mr. Piet Lammertje is, uh, is an aerospace engineer. Uh, he used to work for Fokker Aircraft a very long time ago. And um, he has decided to help us out with a lot of the design activities for the Dragonfly. Um, so um, for this um, masterclass he will be uh, covering a specific topic which is about uh, um, uh, an aerodynamics related topic, I think. Yep. Um, and um, Pete will explain you all about that in the upcoming hour. So I hope it's uh, going to be worthwhile for you all. Um, this will probably be more important for some of the projects for the third year students that are currently uh, um, uh, doing uh, or working on their assignment. Um, but I think it's interesting for all the project groups. So uh, uh, don't hesitate to ask really good questions using the chat function in YouTube. Uh, we have Mark Ommert uh, sitting here standby, uh, who's going to help us out with uh, answering the questions at the end, uh, together with Pete. Um, I will probably be uh, manning or uh, bemanne the, the, the camera. Um, um, and uh, I wish you a lot of fun during the upcoming hour. Good luck, thank you very much, and welcome to Mr. Pete Lommertje. A warm applause. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Piet Lammertsen, and uh, today I'll be talking to you a bit about uh, cowlings and spinners. Um, I should get the next slide now, but... Uh, no. Ah, yes, it works. Uh, okay, um, so the reason we'll be talking about cowlings and spinners is because you all know that we are going to electrify a Dragonfly aircraft. And uh, so a typical Dragonfly has a nose like you see on the screen. So it has big air intakes and it's like uh, cheek cowlings. Um, but for an electric motor that should be different. Maybe the propeller should be different. And anyway, we'll explore that a little bit in the next 45 minutes, hopefully. So I will be talking about streamlined bodies first, uh, then a bit about propellers, and then about cowlings. Now streamlined bodies. Uh, I'm sure you all have a feeling what a streamlined body is like. Uh, it looks a bit like a fish. Uh, it looks a bit like a bird. It looks a bit like an airplane. It looks a bit like a teardrop. Um, so in nature, you see that streamlined bodies have sort of similar shapes, even when they come from very different species, like a tuna is a very different fish from a shark, and a dolphin is even a mammal, and still they all have roughly the same uh, streamlined body shape. So why is that? Um, for those of you who've done aerodynamics courses, you know that in wing sections there is the famous NACA book and report about standard wing sections, and the graph here shows one of those, a thick one. Um, and it shows that uh, at the nose, the velocity graph is starts at zero. That's a stagnation point. Then at the side of the profile, the air speeds around it, and it's actually faster than in free air. And at the tail, at the tra uh, trailing edge, uh, it goes to a stagnation point again, which uh, surprises some people, by the way. Um, so this is a classical, what they call turbulent section, with the uh, maximum thickness fairly far forward, about 30% of cord. And, and this is, well, a good example, a, a very good example of a turbulent wing section. Uh, there are, since uh, maybe 1945 or something, 1940, there are also laminar wing sections, and uh, I will not go into that in much detail, but you do see that there is a difference in the way that uh, the pressure uh, is divided along the cord. So certainly at the first part, when the airplane is lifting a little bit, it has a sort of constant uh, velocity profile on the, on the front part of the airfoil. And then at the rear, it tapers down 
it doesn't even come to a stagnation point. Uh, and that's because the rear of these airfoils is hollow. Uh, it's what they have, they call it a cusp. And a cusp just means a bit of uh, a hollow surface. Uh, so keep that in mind and uh, you see that the maximum thickness of these sections is further aft. It's uh, maybe 50%. And it's intended to keep the airflow nice uh, along the first half of the wing section uh, because as long as, the, uh, as there is no, let's say, increase in pressure on the surface, the boundary layer flows to the rear and is nice and, and hunky-dory. Like I said, there are two stagnation points on a turbulent section. One is obviously at the nose. The air hits uh, the section at the rounded nose and it stops there. And then it parts ways and part of it flows to the top and part to the bottom. And at the rear, which is a bit enlarged and exaggerated here, uh, there is a kink in the, in the flow. There is a, an angle. And so nature doesn't like angles. And flow certainly doesn't. It means that when there is a sharp kink in the, in the flow, this can only happen if either the acceleration is infinite, like bang, bang from one direction to the next, or the flow is stationary, it stands still there. Well, that's what happens. Uh, the flow slows down at the trailing edge of a section like this. And we'll come back to that later. This is uh, a different way of depicting the, the pressure on the airfoil. You see that at the nose there is uh, more pressure than atmospheric. At the top and the bottom there is a bit less pressure than atmospheric. They call it suction, but of course it's not suction. It's only a little bit less than one atmosphere. And at the trail it's, uh, it's plus again. There are two ways that people look at, at flow like that, and I think it's good if you want to have like a, a designer's perspective of shapes uh, that, that, flo that air flows around. Um, there's, there's two perspectives, and sometimes people tell you that you have to use one or you have to use the other, which is nonsense, of course, uh, because they are the same. At the bottom of this picture, you see uh, the way that people who like Bernoulli's equations think about this, like uh, the air is pushed around this section and uh, by some, you know, miracle, uh, it means that uh, the air speeds up uh, next to the section. That's because it has a narrower space to pass through and you would think that it slows down there, but it doesn't because air, air is sort of incompressible, you cannot compress air that is already under one atmosphere of pressure. Uh, so it has to speed up there. And to the rear it slows down again, which makes the stagnation point at the rear. That's one way of looking at it. Um, the other way of looking at flow is that it curves. Now, if you look at the red arrow above, it shows that there must be some force uh, on the air that makes it curve its path. Because if there were no sideways force, the air would go straight ahead. So the curve means that there is a pressure, apparently, pushing it into this uh, curve. Otherwise, you would have, like, hmm, you cannot say that, but centrifugal force. Actually, it's a centripetal force, but well. Um, so uh, there must be uh, a pressure uh, gradient, so a difference in pressure, coming from above to the surface of the airfoil. So actually, um, it's the same thing as saying that there is a low pressure at the, at the thick part of uh, the airfoil, which is a bit surprising to some people, but still, that's how it is. And you can use both ways of looking at flow to predict, even before you do any calculation, that uh, where there is a curvature like that, there has to be a pressure gradient, where there is uh, a channel of air which, make, which goes thinner and then goes wider again, there must be low pressure in that thin channel. So that's about basically still wing sections. Now I'm going to talk about fuselages, bodies of revolution, streamline shapes. Uh, so this is an ideal fuselage. You will not see them in practice, not even in nature. 
You may see them in um, like ideal uh, airships for very low speeds or in uh, human powered submarines sometimes have a shape like this. Uh, so this is an ideal shape uh, but uh, nature may approach the ideal but people certainly don't so you will not see these shapes in airplanes. What you see in airplanes are shapes like this. Actually we are used to airliners with very long fuselages but if we have the freedom to choose our own let's say length to diameter ratio turns out that uh, it's pretty short. Like if you want to uh, clothe the uh, frontal area of one or two people and you want to make a streamlined body that is uh, optimal for that frontal area then the shape is not a very long cigar. Actually the shape is more like an egg. Uh, the, the ratio between length and diameter is uh, like 3 to 1 maximum and if you go for the best volume inside it it's 5 to 1 maybe but it's certainly not as long as an airliner. So airliners are as long as they are for practical reasons and to keep the tail to the rear but it's not because it's the optimal shape really. So the message here is chubby fuselages are okay. The only reason why aircraft, small aircraft don't all look like the one on top is because it has horrible flying qualities because the tail is so short that it wobbles around and it's a dangerous thing to fly. But it's a little racer so it is an efficient shape. Now if you have these small uh, pods uh, to put people into then uh, you could go to the extreme and say okay I'll take that pod but I'll need to put the stabilizer to the rear um, so I'll just put it on a boom. And that's what they started out doing in the 1930s and then today they have something which is, well, if you look at it, it's similar. It's like an egg uh, with a stick. And if you look at our sort of example aircraft, uh, the PPCL Alpha, you can see this, you know. You can see that basically it's an egg with a stick to the rear. And the stick is there to keep the stabilizer to the rear, otherwise it wouldn't be there. So streamlined shapes can be short. Um, they can also be longer for practical reasons like in submarines and airliners. But you will find that uh, on the whole people expect to have a pointed nose on a streamlined shape. But that's supersonic. Uh, that's uh, 1950s age and maybe the F-16 or you know. They do have pointed noses but when you have a subsonic uh, not supersonic uh, flight or a submarine, then the air is warned before you even go there uh, that it should part and go around you. And actually it turns out that you can use pretty blunt noses for that. And in the 1950s when airliners didn't have radar, they used to look like this, you know, they had very rounded noses, maybe almost like a circle, like a sphere. And then of course radar happened and then you've got these weird uh, add-ons to the nose of aircraft to house that new radar. So you see this is an aircraft which had a, a rounded nose and then someone put this like clown's nose on, uh, on the front of it to house the radar. Maybe many of you know the uh, Lockheed Hercules, it's still flying today. Uh, and you know what it's like because you, uh, you've seen it and it looks like the one on the, on the right, on the bottom with that funny nose. But it wasn't designed that way. It was designed like it's in the upper picture. Uh, so it had a rounded nose and actually, uh, you know, that used to be the optimal shape before we needed to put things in that nose tip. So, uh, it's a bit surprising maybe to see that these noses on on these uh, fuselages and submarines and torpedoes and uh, what have you, uh, that they have such a blunt nose. Because we are used to looking at these um, airfoil sections on wing sections and they tend to be f pretty like, uh, slim, you know. Uh, so this is a bit of shaky theory here, uh, but you can 
uh, transform, translate a 2D shape, like something like a wing, and take that pressure distribution and apply that pressure dis distribution to something round, like a torpedo or a fuselage or, or something like that. And then it turns out that uh, to do that, in potential theory, which is the, uh, the simplest theory that we have for flow, uh, it turns out that you need to apply a power law to translate one into the other. And when you apply it, you see that shapes go more blunt. You see that for uh, something round, a body of revolution, uh, which is in light gray here, you see that it has a very blunt nose, and actually it has this egg-shaped tail. If we do the same for a laminar section, the one that had a cusp, like a hollow part at the rear, uh, then we see that um, there is no longer a hollow part on, uh, on a tip tank or a submarine. It's straight. And this is what you see in all older aircraft, that the last part of the fuselage is, is a straight cone. That's mainly, of course, because it's easy to build. Uh, but it, it, has, uh, it has its advantages in terms of flow as well. Um, and we'll get back to that later. Now, that's all. If you have the freedom to make any shape that you like, you will go for like a fuel tank. You'll go like a fuselage, you'll go like a teardrop. But life is not like that. Uh, there are all sorts of things on an airplane like windshields and uh, air inlets and what have you. Uh, and they tend to make the surface wavy, curved or even kinked in places. Uh, like this could be the windshield of a car. So what do the pressures on a car look like? A car doesn't much look like a teardrop uh, because it does have a windshield, uh, which is a kink with the, the bonnet, with the hood on the front. And what happens? You see that the air comes at the front. So that is a stagnation point right there. Then it comes over the top of the, of the hood of the car, which is rounded and it means that there must be a suction peak there because the air curves inward towards the car. Uh, so that means that there must be uh, a suction peak there. And then at the front of the windshield just before, there is a kink and now the air curves up, which means that there must be a force curving the air up there. Um, and that means that at the point that uh, kink between the bonnet and the, and the windshield, there must be a big, big pressure point. And now you know why that is the place where the cabin air enters the car. There is always these, uh, these gills there, these, these, uh, these slits that the air goes into. And you may wonder why it, the, the air intake for the cabin of your car is not somewhere at the front with uh, some nice, you know, uh, big round hole at the front of the car. It's because there is an easier place, and that's the place that we are looking at now. It's the kink between the, the hood and the windshield. Does air actually go into corners like that? No. Nature abhors the vacuum. Nature also doesn't like square angles. So what nature does is uh, the boundary layer uh, doesn't go all the way into the corner, it sort of uh, separates, it creates some sort of vortex, and the effect of the whole thing is nature rounds the flow. Nature makes it curved instead of right angles. And that goes for when you are in a kink that goes uh, like it's hollow, and it also goes if you have a kink that is like the one on the right, like the rear of a car, like the rear window. You see it here again. You see that there are these circulating bubbles of air in places where you would expect to have like a square kink in the, f in, in the air, and it air doesn't do that. Which brings us to improving bad shapes. So like in a car, you cannot avoid having a kink between the bonnet and the, and the windshield. Uh, on an airplane, you can do things. Like if you have a kink between the fuselage and the uh, wing, like here you have it on the Spitfire, uh, and then you fill it out into some streamlined shape. You don't leave that to a separation bubble, which creates a lot of drag. You do it yourself. 
And there are rules for that. The main rule, well, the main rule in transonic flight is the area rule. And I'm going to cheat a little bit because the area rule for transonic flight is a bit different from this one. But you see the result. What you see is that uh, uh, you don't want to have sudden uh, bigger and smaller channels with kinks in them. So if you have a wing there, the wing takes up frontal area. And it means that um, uh, at the rear of the wing, the frontal area decreases and it disappears. Now, boundary layers would not like pressure steps like that. So what you can do is you make a little room. So in this case, in the fuselage of this F5, uh, you make some room. So in the place where the wing starts to displace air, the fuselage displays is a bit less. And it helps. It helps as much as some aircraft like the Delta Dart of the 1950s, where they discovered this. Um, they could not even go supersonic. This was very disappointing to the designers. Until they made this fuselage a bit like the, what they call the Coke bottle shape. And then it did. So this really helps. Um, now that was the transonic area rule. We also have what we call the poor man's area rule. For us people who are like in light planes are very much subsonic, no compressibility, no number of Mach that has any influence, but still you see that this fuselage is very, very nicely built. It has this nose which bulges out, that's okay, uh, but then uh, it has to uh, narrow down a bit because you don't want to go that way all the way back. You only want to go where the, where the person sits uh, inside the cockpit. So first you narrow it down a bit, but then you have this fillet at the front of the wing that already starts to fill in that gap. And then after that you can, because the fuselage is going thicker, if the, the wing is going thicker, uh, you find that uh, um, you, can, you can taper the fuselage a bit down. But then when the wing, when you follow the wing, uh, in many aircraft it's like the fuselage tapers even further. And uh, that means that uh, the wing tapers to a thinner point, the fuselage goes thinner, then you need these massive fillets like the one on the Spitfire that you just saw. What you can also do, and that's a very good idea, is not to taper the fuselage there. You keep the fuselage side straight, uh, even though it's a bit wider than you need, and then you taper only after the wing. But, of course, when the wing goes thinner, uh, that leaves a gap in the air, if you like, and one thing to fill it out is to put the cockpit there. So you put this nicely streamlined uh, canopy in the place, exactly in the place where the wing goes thinner. Now, of course, it's not in the same uh, frontal position, so it does require that the air flows a bit to the side, over the cowling, then to the side, down a bit, you know, in the hole behind the wing. Um, so there is a bit of trickery involved, but, well, air doesn't mind. And uh, that, uh, this is the airplane that I just showed you the design for. This is the actual airplane, and this went an incredible, uh, an incredible miles per hour on a very, very, very small motor. This was a racing airplane, and a very efficient one. And a very beautiful airplane. So now, we go to cowlings. Uh, what does a cowling look like? Well, it's basically uh, the nose of, uh, of a streamlined body, uh, but it has some holes in it. And traditionally, there are on light planes, there are two holes to the side of the propeller. Why is that? That's because there is an engine behind it, which has two cylinders to the left and two cylinders to the right. Boxer engines, they're called, because the, uh, the, the pistons, they box, they, they oppose each other, they go together, they, go, they split apart, they go together. And uh, that happens like on every revolution of the motor. Um, so the, the things that need cooling, those are the cylinders. And that's why there are holes at the start of the cowling to let the cooling air enter. Is that an optimal shape? Not really. But you can make optimal shapes 
much more optimal anyway, if you have liquid cooling. And this is something that we will be looking at for the dragonfly. And you see that it changes the shape of the nose tremendously. Uh, because now you don't need, well, there is a, an air intake on this one, but the real, the real cooler is on the bottom of the fuselage. It's that hole there, and uh, some other time I'll tell you a bit more about cooling and internal flow. This doesn't look very efficient, does it? It looks like there is a big draggy thing hanging below the fuselage, but, well, it is a good uh, place to put. It's below the wing, it has a bit of uh, uh, plus pressure, uh, it's to the rear so it doesn't spoil your boundary layer at the nose. This airplane actually had a sort of laminar flow, it was one of the first airplanes to have a laminar flow uh, airfoil. So you don't want to have all these bumpy things at the front because they spoil your boundary layer. This was a very very efficient airplane for its day. Now Let's look at something which wasn't quite so great. Uh, I've looked up this example of something, I think it's an electric motor, I'm not even sure. Uh, but anyway, it's a simple fuselage. And there is not much wrong with simple fuselages uh, that are square when you look at them from the front. Um, but there is something wrong with this fuselage. It has a nice spinner, it has nice flowing lines. But if you look at it, it's like a pointed cone, then a sort of a square box and then a cone, a squarish cone again. Now if you look at the frontal area of that, it looks a bit like this. Like the top one is the top view of the fuselage. But if you apply this, this rule that we showed for, uh, for wing sections, well, I just made a sketch here of the frontal area. You see that it's pretty horrible uh, because at the start uh, it has a pointed nose. Well, that's fine, I guess. But then it suddenly becomes a hollow nose, if you look in terms of frontal area. And then there is this terrible kink at the start of the, uh, of the boxy fuselage. So even though, like if you look back at the thing, it doesn't look so bad, does it? But it is really bad, actually. Uh, so noses, they should be a bit blunt, they should be rounded, they should be convex, and they should never be hollow or, or even straight. Now I have to talk a little bit about propellers. So this is a nice picture of a propeller and it, it shows you a lot of things. I'll be talking about propellers some other day again. Uh, what you see here is, and what you see in the next picture too, um, but let's look at this one first. What you see here is that the air flows to the rear from the propeller disc, if you like, from the, the plane that the propeller turns in. Um, now people always think that that uh, flow behind the propeller is like uh, an enormous, you know, uh, corkscrew, it's like a prop wash, it's like a contracting tube, it's like you hear all these stories. What you see here, it's, it's not a contracting tube at all. It's more like a, a nice cylinder with not much contraction. So how, how, how is that? That's a bit surprising, actually. The reason is that uh, on a propeller, the inside part of the propeller, uh, it has what they call a high pitch angle, so the blades point forward a lot. At the tip, they are quite flat. At the core of the propeller, they point forward a lot. So when they lift, they give a lot of, let, let's say, they push the air a lot to the side, in rotation, and they don't do much in terms of thrust. And because that's inefficient, uh, actual propellers actually are built to make even less thrust near the center of the propeller. You can almost say that the inner 50% of the propeller blade, which is a small area anyway, right, because it's only half the diameter, so it's only a quarter of the frontal area, but even that quarter of frontal area is actually not very much loaded. So even if there were a big prop wash uh, coming from that propeller, it would not touch the fuselage. It would go like in a ring around the fuselage. It, it would not uh, give much extra friction drag. It doesn't. And anyway, uh, in cruising flight, uh, you will find that that whole 
you know, whirling prop wash behind the propeller, it adds only like 5 or 10 percent to the speed of the, uh, of the airflow. Uh, it wouldn't be efficient if it did more. So there are many reasons why it's, it's a fallacy to think that the propeller uh, is something that, that, that spoils the flow over the uh, airplane or that you know, pusher propellers must be more efficient because they don't push all this prop wash over the fuselage. That is actually all not true. What is true is uh, that you can make that propeller, uh, you can make the inner, inner part of the propeller disappear. Um, so many people think that if you put a spinner on an airplane, on the propeller, uh, it means that somehow the middle part of the pro propeller um, uh, disappears, it doesn't work. It's, it's, they seem to think that the air goes right through the airplane, uh, only this time uh, it doesn't hit the uh, propeller blades. That's not quite what happens. What happens is that before the nose of this airplane, the air parts, as always, so it diverges and uh, it, it makes this nice curve around the fuselage and at the end of the fuselage it closes again hopefully to a very small wake because if it's a big wake that means there's a lot of drag. Um, so actually the propeller there is working uh, not in a closed circle but in something of a ring uh, but it's still true that the core uh, the let's say the uh, the core of this propeller so the the root of the blade it still should not give any thrust uh, because otherwise at the end of the fuselage it would close down again and it would make this this like little vortex uh, which represents a lot of loss so the fuselage displaces the flow but the flow doesn't disappear. You can see it very nicely on this 1914 airplane, 1915. Uh, you can also see it on this one. Um, and this is a horrible airplane again. This is a derivative of a jet airplane and they try to make it powered by uh, a propeller, which is a supersonic propeller. The outer 30% of this propeller uh, were actually even on the ground when it was running stationary. Uh, they were supersonic. And this, Wikipedia tells me, was the loudest aircraft ever built. Uh, when this thing was running on the ground, uh, it made so much noise that it could be heard 25 miles away. Um, it, it damaged uh, equipment in the control tower and it made people nauseous who were even near it. And one guy who was uh, uh, near this aircraft actually had a fit, he had a seizure from the noise. It was that noisy. On the other hand, there can be very quiet aircraft. And what they typically have is a very big, slow-turning propeller. Uh, slow-turning, that's important because it means that you have a low uh, tip, Mach number, actually a low tip speed. Uh, and that's nice because it doesn't make so much noise noise goes to the sixth or eighth power or something of velocity. So it really, really helps to slow the tips down. Uh, but also it means that there is a lot of pitch angle even at the tip when you have a slow, slow turning propeller. Uh, and that hurts efficiency, you know. Then you make a lot of rotational loss right at the tip already and not just at the core. And, and you can help that a little bit uh, by loading the propeller less. So you can help it by, uh, by giving it a larger diameter. Because in, in uh, normal airplanes, you see that the uh, propeller disc is smallish relative to the span of the wings. Um, now this has a very large span, but even then you can see that the propeller is a, is a larger proportion of, uh, of the wingspan than it normally is. So that's good. Um, Practically the bad thing about this is that the propeller needs ground clearance. It shouldn't be a lawnmower, you know, it, you don't need to mow the grass with it. And uh, so this, this airplane uh, has a problem with its undercarriage. And actually all airplanes do. Uh, the undercarriage is the limiting factor on propeller diameter. Di di propellers are always too small. People know that. Uh, but it can't be helped because uh, there is an end to how much 
you can extend the nose wheel. Well, this one doesn't even have a nose wheel. And, and so here they made the, uh, let's say, the, the trick of putting the propeller even above the cockpit. Now, that's nice, but for a practical airplane, I don't think you would do this because you also want to see from the cockpit. Now, I'll not go into that too deeply, but this is like a regulation. It's not mandatory, but it's a regulation for airplanes, for in this case for airliners, that tell you how much up, how much down, and how much to the left you should be able to look. So it's, it's pretty, you know, confrontational to see that uh, the pilot in command on the left of the airplane doesn't actually see to the right. It's dependent on the co-pilot for that, because the co-pilot, of course, has the mirror image of this, uh, of this viewing angle. So that's um, quite surprising. And when you're in an airplane, it is always quite surprising to me to see how high actually the dashboard is, how high the instruments are, and how little view there is over the tip of the nose. Of course, there's always worse to come. Maybe you've heard of the designer Bert Root then. He is uh, like uh, the Elon Musk of um, the airplane world. He is quite admired. Uh, maybe one of the few people in the world who don't admire him because his designs are always extreme. They are rarely uh, you know, well motivated. He is just playing for fun and, uh, and they cut corners. Uh, like on this one, which is a very interesting airplane by the way, um, and very well thought out in terms of asymmetric thrust and things like that. What he sacrificed simply is a view. You cannot look out of this airplane. Well, you can, you know, there are portholes. But this is really a horrible airplane from a safety point of view. And I think I would call this irresponsible. You don't design airplanes like that. That's my opinion anyway. So, um, that brings us uh, to uh, the way it could be done. And I think this is a good example. This is by one uh, Roy Lopresti. And he was an aircraft engineer who sort of made improvement kits for existing airplanes. He made them fly slower in landing. He made them have higher top speeds. He did all sorts of little tricks with fillets and uh, fairings and, and what he did to the cowling of the Mooney 201, which was already a fast airplane, it was called 201 because it went 201 miles per hour on 200 horsepower, uh, he made this cowling like thinner to the sides, which gives you a good view over the edge of the cowling. And he just kept that, that little bit of torpedo shape behind the spinner. Um, to fare it into the fuselage. So he could use a fairly big spinner, which is good, uh, which helps to hide the bad parts of the propeller. Uh, and he had a high thrust line, and, uh, and he made good by sort of, uh, yeah, you know, sanding away the sides of the top of the cowling to give you a decent view anyway. So this, to me, is something that we could be using, uh, a concept like this is something that we could be using uh, on the Dragonfly propeller. Um, it could be that we raise the thrust line a bit, we increase the diameter of the pro propeller a little bit, because it will be a slow turning, therefore a little bit inefficient propeller. And um, anyway, um, we want to have the biggest propeller that we can get away with in terms of ground clearance. So we should raise the thrust line a little bit and then maybe we can do this and maybe it's not so bad that we have this like bump on the center of the cowling there. Uh, maybe we can get away with that little bit loss of, uh, of view. So those are my parting thoughts uh, for you on the subject of a new cowling. Um, and that's uh, that will give you something to think about and maybe to ask questions about. I, I would not leave you without this thought. Um, you know, uh, I was born in 1951, smack bang into the jet age, and I never got to like jet aircraft. I always liked propellers. They're so much more efficient and so much nicer to look at and so much less, more, less noisy. Um, 
So I would suggest to you that we are grown-ups. Uh, jets are for kids. Thank you. <laughs> so we have some audience sitting in the back of the lab as well. An audience of two. <laughs> and we have uh, a couple of dozen people actually sitting uh, at home or elsewhere, uh, but they've uh, joined online. Uh -huh. um, thank you very much, Pete. Okay. I'm going to invite uh, Mark over to uh, be here to support uh, Pete on the chat. Yes, so uh, thank you, Pete. Uh, it was really interesting. At least I find it really interesting. I also saw in, uh, in, uh, in one of the group chats uh, uh, within the lab uh, that uh, someone else at home uh, also enjoyed it uh, really uh, as we did. Um, so thanks. Um, in the chat there are no real questions, but I also uh, know that there is a 30 second delay um, uh, between here and at home. So um, yeah, so if you have questions, put it into the chat. In the meantime, I actually have a question, which is, uh, well, one of the uh, student groups for the third year semester project are working on a new coding. Mm -hmm. So you already well mentioned something uh, on this. Um, but I'm actually wondering, um, or they actually they need to choose a certain geometry to work on uh, in the in the upcoming weeks. Yeah. Um, also from stru structural perspective, maybe make it uh, smart using sensors or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but what steps would you advise to uh, make a conceptual decision on well, the, the, the geometry rather soon? Yeah, I see. Well, you know, I think the main, the main thing that would set this airplane apart from the normal Dragonfly is the propeller. That is the big difference. And uh, we haven't finished the propeller studies yet, but I'm convinced that if you take a, s a slower turning propeller, uh, then by itself it will be less efficient because it will cause more rotation. And we have to make up for that a little bit. And the best way to make up for it is by increasing the diameter and lowering the loading of the propeller. That would bring it down to maybe the same efficiency of the original propeller. Um, now, since there is this issue of ground clearance and you don't want to build a lawnmower, um, it means that you should try to shift the propeller up as much as you can. Um, so in that sense, it would be ideal to have a very small spinner uh, because that would allow you to put the uh, propeller very high in front of the cabin and still not obstruct your view. But to have a, a very small spinner means that you have a big part bad part of the propeller exposed. So from that point of view, what you really would like to do is to have a huge big spinner and, and hide the core of the propeller altogether, like in the, uh, the yellow biplane that I showed, um, or even more. Um, so those are two conflicting requirements, and I think you have to sort of find your way on what is the optimal solution on how high can you get th the thrust line and still have a decent flow from the spinner into the cowling, uh, etc. So that, that is the main, I think, difficulty. And uh, the other thing to watch out for, I think, is you don't want to go in the direction of that, that black airplane that I showed with the pointy nose. It looks like it has a nice streamline, but you know, we are not jet fighters. We are not supersonic. So what we really need is a, is a nicely rounded, fairly blunt nose. And certainly we don't want a kink at the firewall. We want a nice flowing lines from the cowling into the rest of the fuselage. So don't be tempted to make a nice and pointy snout, you know, because it, it may look uh, like optimal to the layman, but it's not. It should be rounded, very convex, very like, like, a, like a balloon mm -hmm. that, you, that you blow up. Those are the two main things. And some other time I will talk maybe a little bit more about cooling, air inlets for cooling. Uh, and again, uh, don't think that the air inlet for a cooler needs to be at the front. It could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. Anywhere where you can place an air intake, even like you saw on the Mustang airplane, the one that has the cooler below the fuselage, that's fine too. As long as it has an opening to the front, it will take in air. 
Um, so probably you don't want to spoil the nose of the airplane with an air intake if you can avoid it. It's better to put the air intake a little bit more to the bottom, to the rear, to the wherever, uh, but not at the nose of the airplane. So those, I think I now mentioned three points that, <laughs> that are worth, uh, worth watching. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. And of course there are some limitations also for the Dragonfly. Yeah. Um, but uh, I saw somewhere on the, on the internet, uh, bigger is better, uh, <laughs> related to spinners. Uh, yeah. And, well, I also hear that a little bit out of your story. Yeah. Um, but there is more to look at. Um, but I think, so, so the advice for the groups for now would be uh, find the trade-off between, well, uh, the, the, the three topics that you just mentioned. Yeah. However, I can also uh, think about that it will take a lot of time to do that. So, so if, if yeah. you make sort of a trade-off, uh, is that a little bit of bigger spinner um, and prevent curvatures? Is that basically the idea? I think, yeah, or have, have, have rounded curvatures, not never hollow anyway. Yeah. Never make a hole in the side of the fuselage or at the bottom or something like that. Always keep it rounded and like puffed up uh, and that will give you a good streamline. And as for spinners, yeah, there is this compromise between you want a high thrust line and you want a big spinner and you cannot have them both at the same time. And this is why I showed this, this Mooney 201 nose where it's sort of like a compromise. Mm. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, at least someone mentioned that uh, he really likes uh, propellers. Propellers are amazing. Yes, uh, they are. So that's uh, definitely yeah. cool. Um, so one question from Christiana. Have you thought of your perfect design or your favorite aircraft which hits all the spots? <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yes, I have. I don't have a picture of it with me. Uh, you know, that touches on, uh, on, on conceptual airplane design. Can I use three minutes for that? Um, it's like this. Um, we have electric motors now, and they are different in nature from internal combustion engines. And internal combustion engines, they run at a fixed RPM. It's difficult to gear them because they are sort of bumpy and dong, 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 you know, so you don't want to use any belts and things on those, even though it's used in cars, of course. Um, electric airplanes, they have this separation between a small electric motor, which runs very smoothly and you can belt drive it and have a very big propeller somewhere, and the weight of the, of the uh, batteries, and that could be anywhere, it doesn't have to be near the motor. And this separation is new uh, in, in uh, internal combustion uh, motors. You know, the motor has to be with the propeller, period. It has to be, which means that basically it has to be at the front. Uh, and there is not a good case for pusher propellers in an internal combustion engine, uh, even though some people have used them. But, you know, in, a, um, in an electric airplane, if you really want to have a huge big propeller, which is very efficient, certainly at low velocities, you don't want to put it at the nose. So maybe this time we could put it at the rear, somewhere up, up above the, f up above the cabin. Uh, so then we could, uh, for center of gravity reasons, you still need a weight in the nose. Otherwise the people will be not in the center of gravity, the passengers. So you need this big weight somewhere and you can put it in the front, which is a very safe place because if you fly through a barn, then the batteries will pave your way which is what happens now in uh, internal combustion engines. They sort of pave your way through any obstacle that you, uh, that you uh, happen to hit and you're safe behind that engine. Now, so it boils down to, do you want those big batteries at the nose, maybe a bit down so you have a good view, but not the propeller. You want to have the propeller big, big, big with this uh, light engine behind the cabin at the top. So now you have this egg-shaped fuselage, uh, and then, oh, you need to put the, the uh, elevator somewhere. Well, it can't be helped. You have to have two tail booms with uh, a, a stabilizer between the two tail booms, maybe a T-tail there, maybe something. There's plenty of examples of that. And then you have actually, it falls into place. If you do the math, then uh, that's a very good concept. It looks very different. It even looks a bit old-fashioned. But I think, 
I think that uh, in future, you know, this could be the optimum concept for an electric airplane. Mm. All right. So actually electric flight is opening uh, a lot of opportunities in the design of Well, the yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, there are like, there are de there's designers and there's inventors, you know? And then the inventors are the ones that think that what they just thought of, they're the first one to think of it. And uh, so they think it's all new and they want to uh, have a patent on it and they want to be rich. Um, and designers, they know their stuff. They know that it's been done ten times, a hundred times, you know, airplanes have been around. I showed you one in, uh, from 1915. You can't do much better than that if you have uh, an engine like that. Then you need a braced biplane. It, if you would design one today, it would still be a braced biplane with wires, you know. Um, so these people were not stupid. That you can see it by their spinner. Uh, and if we had the same engines today and we wouldn't have much lighter internal combustion engine, we would still build airplanes like that. Um, so there is no, there is no, you know, there is no free lunch. Um, so I think uh, what sets a designer apart is that he knows his history. He knows why airplanes look the way they look. He doesn't go around like Bert Root and, and say, look, if I put it, uh, you know, in the reverse, I put uh, the stabilizer at the front, it must be better because it carries weight. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does carry weight, but it's not more efficient. It's bad. And, you know, these are inventors. I hate them. Uh, but if you have designers, uh, then they will be able to tell you why a modern light plane doesn't look like that. Why it looks the way it looks. It's not because of conservatism. Uh, it's because that is actually the optimum if you take everything into account. If you take into account that you need to look out of the cockpit, if you take into account safety, if you take into account that it needs to land on grass, if you take into account that it has a low landing speed, you know, if you take all these things into account, you get a, a Cessna 150. And maybe these days it's more like a plastic airplane. But anyway, you get something like that. And that's because it, has, it all has a reason. But one of the reasons, of course, is the way internal combustion engines work. And now something changes. We have an electric motor and it sets different constraints. So now if you know your history, you know that this opens an opportunity for a real conceptual change. Not because you just invented something, but because the optimum shifted. And, and that's what makes this a very, very interesting exercise to me. It means that now we can actually go back to basics, see what the requirements were, see why the people in the hundred years before us did it the way they did it, and then think, if they had had this engine in 1915, they would have designed it like this, different. And that's, that's, we are put in the position that airplane designers were in 1915, you know? It's new, it's interesting, it's uh, uncharted territory. And that's what makes this assignment so, uh, so exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, now the question is uh, to the students, are we inventors or designers or what would you like to do? At least if you want to be friends with Pete, then uh, be a designer. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but next year you will be uh, doing an engineering entrepreneurship project or minor. So yeah. uh, also the entrepreneurial skills are important in that sense, but especially in this revolution. But an entrepreneur is in no different position than a designer. An entrepreneur doesn't want to fall in love with his own idea. You know, an entrepreneur wants to fall in love with the customer uh, and, and not with his own solution. He needs to be looking for what the customer's problem was. He doesn't want to push his own solution. And that is why I also do not like the likes of Elon Musk, but you know, <laughs> that's a different story. Is, is well that called the Stockholm Syndrome? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Elon Musk is now also going to uh, to make electric aircraft actually. So I saw that in the yeah. last week. So, uh, yeah. but there is actually one more question from uh, from a student, uh, Tell. Um, how does placing a cal uh, further back in the turbulent flow affect performance of the cooling system compared to an air intake with laminar flow? Aha, uh -huh, yes. Um, well, that goes to internal flow. Look, there's two types of air intakes, basically. 
the ones that you see that have these uh, like these diverging uh, ducts and they are flush with the surface. It's called the NACA flush inlet. Uh, and then the, they look very nice and the air sort of dives into them from the boundary layer. They have only like, uh, you get only 85% of the total pressure of the, uh, of the air that flows by. I can show you examples some other time. The other type is a hole at the front. It's called a pitot entrance. Uh, well, pitot was, I don't know, 1850 or something. And that entrance, that like the big hole at the front, looking into the airstream, it has an, uh, a pressure recovery of 100%. It's perfect. There's no, you know, you can even side slip it a little bit. It will be perfect. So that's the entrance to go for. But that entrance has to point in the direction of the wind. And if the wind goes a bit to the up or it goes a bit down, the wind basically follows the surface. So if you make a pitot entrance which points into the local flow, it will always have 100% pressure recovery. But you don't want to be in the laminar uh, or even turbulent boundary layer. You want to be a little bit outside. So that's why pitots often have, like they are a bit on a, on a, on a, on a wall and then the wall parts the air at the surface and the pitot comes out on top. And that's the way to do it because then you have full pressure recovery. So having a good air inlet means having it outside the boundary layer for one. And it doesn't matter where it is. You saw on that Mustang airplane that it had it below the fuselage. But you could also see that it had it a little way, a bit away from the fuselage. So that's a perfect, a perfect place. You'll have 100% recovery. The problem comes inside. Once you have this flow into the, uh, into the duct that takes it to wherever it needs to go, like into uh, a carburetor or into the intake of the engine or into uh, the cooling uh, radiator, there you have a problem because then it sort of has to slow down to zero velocity from full flight velocity. And slowing down air means a diverging duct, it means increasing pressure, it means boundary layers that are separating, it's a big, big problem. So it's, it's the intake is not the problem, it's the duct after the intake that's the problem. That has to, t uh, you have to really take a lot of care there. But that's like an entire subject on, it o on its own. All right. Yeah, so um, I'm also looking at the time. It's uh, mm. two past uh, three. So um, I think we also should wrap up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a lot of, uh, well, uh, subjects there where we can talk even for hours more on it. Oh, yes. Um, but for that, I think there will be, will be a net next episode in the near future. Uh, so I heard already something about cooling and about propellers. Well, we'll see. Um, but I think uh, I would like to invite Arnold for a, a small closure word, maybe. Um, but at least, thank you. And I think also from home, thank you very much. I already see some... Uh, You're quite welcome. Some notes into the chat. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. And um, I realize I actually forgot to, uh, to give you an extensive introduction. Mm. So perhaps we can do that some other time during a, a sure. future lecture. Uh, but there was a quite a, a lot of th things I actually uh, learned today. And I never realized that, and perhaps, uh, Mark, you can rotate the camera a little bit. Uh, and I never realized that, um, you know, uh, normally we, we say things like, let's reinvent the wheel. But it should actually be, let's redesign the wheel, uh, yes. if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Right? First, understand the wheel. Exactly, exactly. So uh, I think that's a very big uh, uh, philosophic lesson, I suppose, uh, for today. Um, I have actually ended with, uh, with a question in the chat as well, and perhaps Mark didn't want to uh, address it. But uh, <laughs> my, my question was, you know, if you think of uh, um, um, being a good designer, uh, yeah. which I think is a very good point. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure if I'm actually an inventor or a designer. Uh, so it could be that at the end you will end up hating me. And we were all, all born as inventors. <laughs> we need to... Uh <laughs> all right, so we're born as inventors and trying to become a good designer. I yes. think we know each other now for 18 years already, mm. um, or even more. Um, um, is there, a, is there a, a television series that you would recommend to us, uh, particularly to the students who are now sitting at home in a lockdown situation, you know, stuck with Netflix? Is yeah. there a television series that you actually recommend to us so that we can actually become better designers? Um, 
I'm not so sure. Um, there are television series about aerodynamics, by the way. Uh, they're 1950s, they're black and white, and there's these, you know, uh, scientists with these heavy German accents uh, who are explaining aerodynamics. I love those. Yeah. Um, but it's not about how you become a good designer. Um, I think there are different, uh, dif different books for that. I'd have to think. Uh, but if you have, uh, if you're looking to to get rich from design, then I think um, there is something called what's it called? Uh, the minimum viable product. The, uh, there there are books about that, and they actually tell you that you should uh, do small experiments. Uh, you should understand what you're doing. You should uh, uh, understand your customers in that case, or your requirements, and then you build it up from there. You don't have this grand vision. You start with something simple, and then you make it more complex as you go along, and you will find, I think Jos Merleman made this uh, talk last week about designing a haptic uh, dental trainer, and uh, I think he had questions about what was the biggest goof up that you had, and he said, oh, many. Um, but one of the biggest uh, he mentioned was that there was no sound. And we all know that, you know, dentist drills make sound, uh, horrible sound. And the dentist told us that they didn't need it. And as soon as they started using it, their first prototype, they said, where's the sound? And we said, look, you said yourself uh, that you did not need sound. So, you know, you cannot trust customers. You cannot find requirements that easily. You have to prototype, test, and then find out what you did wrong. Um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, if anything, uh, there is no first time right. No. But, and there's a lot of things you're, you're actually touching on uh, right now. First of all, you were trying to say that I should fall in love my, with my customer. And now you're telling me that I actually should not trust my customer. So I should fall in love with someone who I cannot trust. Well, oh, you should fall in love enough ambiguous. with your customer to observe them instead of talk to them. Very good, very <laughs> good. No, and um, I realize I'm not very serious here anymore, but uh, bottom line is, uh, don't go to Netflix, read a good book instead. I think that was actually... That is actually uh, good advice anyway, yeah. Even though I showed you a lot of pictures today, yeah. uh, I didn't read it, uh, I didn't learn it that way. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, again, and I realize we're over time, uh, big time. Uh, hopefully some other time uh, we can uh, talk about another topic. Um, I would like to uh, end today's session. I want to thank Mark for, uh, for uh, hosting the, the chat uh, session and um, help us helping us out uh, with setting up this, uh, this broadcast. I want to thank uh, Pete Lomitz uh, big time as well. And uh, we'll be talking some more uh, uh, airplane business afterwards. And I hope you do as well at home. And I want to wish you uh, a very good day and good luck. And probably see you next week during uh, one of the uh, sessions online for the third year project. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good day. Bye bye.